Hey, what's going on, role players? It's the Bard here, and welcome back to the corner. So, what with this recent outbreak, a lot of us are stuck at home, and I've had a chance to really have a good look through my Dungeon Master's Guide. So, as I've said before, as good as the D&D 5e rules are, I've always felt that they were a little bit too skewed in the favour of the players, and everyone was a little bit too powerful, but I think I have found exactly the optional rule that I was looking for. So some of you may already be familiar with this, but for those of you who aren't and are looking for a new challenge, I think you're going to be in for a treat here. In the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's a section that says Adventuring Options, and on page 267, there's a section called Rest Variants. And one of these variants is called Gritty Realism. So the whole thing goes like this. This variant uses a short rest of 8 hours and a long rest of 7 days. This puts the brakes on a campaign requiring the players to carefully judge the benefits and drawbacks of combat. Characters can't afford to engage in too many battles in a row and all adventuring requires careful planning. This approach encourages the characters to spend time out of the dungeon. It's a good option for campaigns that emphasize intrigue, politics and interactions among other NPCs and in which combat is rare or something to be avoided rather than rushed into. It might not seem like much on the surface. But when you consider just how many of a character's abilities are tied to refreshing during either a short or long rest, this really transforms the game. Not only is recovering lost hit points more difficult, but it also makes somewhat trivial encounters far more dangerous, as well as completely redefining your character and their approach to everything they do. Furthermore, it's not simply a case of just waiting those seven days for all of your long rest abilities to refresh. A character is still going to have to abide by all the rules laid out in the DM's guide when it comes to a long rest. While you can still do light activities such as reading, eating, talking, standing watch for a couple of hours, you still have to abide by the fact that if you perform at least an hour of walking, fighting, casting spells or similar activities, you don't benefit from the rest. You have to start it again from the beginning in order to gain the full effect. This means seven days practically in isolation where you're not doing anything, not interacting with anyone, and not risking the opportunity where you could potentially have to restart your rest again from the beginning. So with all those things in mind, let's delve back into the characters, have a look at some of their abilities, some of their special functions and archetypes, and see just how much this optional rule changes things for them. So let's see how this affects our characters. We'll use the wizard as an example. So the Great Realism rule is going to be a big one for the wizard. Not only is it going to really affect things like their spellcasting, but it's also going to put a lot more emphasis on things like magic items and some of the abilities that they use, particularly things like their arcane recovery, which allows them to refresh their spell slots. So we're starting off with preparing and casting spells. Now we tend to take a lot of this for granted because after a day of sleep, we tend to just refresh all of our spell slots, renew all of our spell selections, and just move on with it. But some things still vary. Now with this option, you're going to have to take the full seven days in order to refresh yourself enough to A, get back all your spell slots, and B, have a clean slate in order to prepare new spells. However, the act of actually preparing spells doesn't change. You still need at least one minute per spell level for each spell on your spell list. So it's taken us almost seven days now of doing practically nothing in order to be able to even memorize any spells. And of course, once we cast them, we're going to have to consider the fact that we're going to need a long rest again in order to get back any of our spell slots that we've used. So that's another seven days. Fortunately, however, characters with the ritual casting ability can still make use of those since your spell selection doesn't go away until you've actually completed the long rest. So the wizards actually luck out here. They're doing very well in the sense that they only need their book available in order to cast ritual spells, unlike characters like clerics, for example, who would need to have their spell prepared in order to use it as a ritual. So with only adding 10 minutes to the casting time, ritual spells are going to be vital for any character with that ability. Even though it's cast at its lowest level, it's still going to provide some form of utility magic for the rest of the party, so at least there are going to be options where you're not completely going to run out of things that you can do. 
cantrips really rise in importance as well, considering the fact that they don't require any kind of spell slots or any kind of rest in order to use. But you're going to have to really think about which ones you take, considering you're going to be relying on them so much more because you don't have as much access to your general spell selection. So your arcane recovery is also really important, and it really gets changed by this variant. So once per day, after a short rest, you're allowed to regain some of your spell slots equal to half your level. Now, considering the fact that with this variant, you're only going to be able to get a short rest after eight hours, what this essentially means is that each day after you rest, you'll be able to get back some spell slots, but only a small fraction of them. This means that this ability goes from something that you, in some cases, may rarely ever use, to something that becomes vital usage every single day. At level 18 you get your spell mastery. Fortunately this is an ability that doesn't actually change very much but there are still things you need to note about it. For example, you still need to have those spells prepared even to cast that level 1 and level 2 spell at will. Changing your spell mastery spells still requires 8 hours of study. However, if you change those spells to something that you don't have prepared, you're going to have to take the full long rest in order to be able to prepare those spells in order to cast them at will using the spell mastery ability. So if you aren't careful about what it is you're picking then you might find yourself having to take a long rest in order to get access to spells that you should be able to cast at will. And finally at level 20 you have your signature spells. You gain two spells both of which have to be third level and of course you always have these spells prepared and you can cast each of them after a short or a long rest. So even if you've run out of spell slots, you still have a couple of options here as well. Although they're not quite as flexible as before, again, every time you finish a short rest, which in this case will be the full eight hours, you'll get those abilities refreshed as well. It's not just your core abilities that change, but also your character's archetype as well. So in the case of the wizard, it's your arcane tradition. So for this specific example, I'm going to choose Transmuter, and we'll see just how much this variant changes exactly what that arcane tradition can do. So every school of magic for the wizard in the arcane traditions in the player's handbook has a savant ability, which dictates a reduced cost and a reduced time to copy spells of your particular school into your spellbook. Fortunately, this is not rest dependent, and as such, it doesn't change. Fortunately as well, your minor alchemy ability at level 2 and your level 6 transmuter stone don't change either, since they're not rest dependent. This means you can use those abilities as you normally would, without too much concern as to whether or not you're going to be able to engage in a short or long rest. Shape Changer is the first of the transmutations, traditions, abilities that do require you to have a rest in order to use it. You can do this after a short or a long rest, but in this case it means you'll only be able to use that polymorph spell without expending a spell slot once per day. Finally at level 14 you've got your Master Transmuter ability, so this is things like your Panacea for Full Cure or your Raise Dead. This doesn't technically change, but when you use it you have to take a long rest before you can actually remake your transmuter stone. So if you want to use any of those powerful abilities that you get by sacrificing your transmuter stone, while you can still use them, while it doesn't affect that, you do have to then wait a full seven days before you can even remake your stone. So you can't be as liberal with it as you once were. So the transmuter does quite well. There's not too much that it has to worry about when it comes to rest, but there are still a few abilities that it has which do require you to put some thought into whether or not it's practical to use them or not. Every one of these arcane traditions actually has something within it which is going to be affected by this rest variant. So the Abjurer's Arcane Ward takes a bit of a hit, you can't recast it until you take a long rest, and the spells that you would normally use to recharge it are also somewhat limited. Conjurers can only use their Benign Transposition ability once per long rest, or if they cast a Conjuration spell of first level or higher, putting some limitation on that ability, if you're a Diviner, you can only use your Portent ability, your Foretelling rolls, twice within a seven day period. Enchanters might seem like they're having a bit of a tough time when it comes to things like their Hypnotic Gaze or their Instinctive Charm. If a creature successfully saves against either of these effects, it can't be affected 
again until you complete a long rest. Evokers, I think, probably get hit the hardest, even though none of their abilities are actually fully dependent on short or long rest. Everything they do is based on their spells. So essentially, whenever they cast something, their arcane tradition usually comes into effect. Both Sculpt Spell and Empowered Evocation require the spellcaster to expend spell slots, and Overchannel requires not only the expenditure of spell slots, but also having to take potential damage as well if you start to use it too much, meaning it's a very dangerous gamble for the Evoker. Illusionists can't make as much use of the illusory self ability as they might like to, and Necromancers suffer a little bit as well because their Grim Harvest is tied to their spellcasting, and the raising of undead using animate dead spell is going to be much more difficult to keep going consistently because of how many spells you're expending and how often you can get them back. So I'd really like to try out this rest variant. I think it's one that I'm going to trial and if it's not hindering the gameplay too much and the players are enjoying the challenge then I think I would like to use it a lot more often. Again, this is something that completely changes the dynamic of the game. Not only that, it changes fundamentally what your characters can and cannot do. Something I'm also intrigued about is the viability of certain archetypes. Most people wouldn't normally look at the champion, but considering none of the champion's abilities are affected by the short or long rest, it's something that becomes a lot more viable within this context of a variation to how your characters recover. Compare this to someone like an Eldritch Knight who's also going to have to worry about their hit point total as well as the fact they've got their spell slot expenditure and many of their later abilities are tied to spell casting as well. So in order to use those they're going to have to be dipping into their resources and an Eldritch Knight doesn't have that many spells available to them. This thing was just hidden away in a dusty little corner in the Dungeon Master's Guide so I'm wondering just how many people know it was there. Did any of you already know about this optional rule? And if you did, have you managed to implement it? And how did it go? Tell me in the comments below. Did this rule cause your characters or your players to have to up their game and become master tacticians? Or did it just completely grind everything to a halt? I would like to know about it if you've got some experience with it already. If you made it all the way to the end here, you deserve yourself a good long rest. If you like this idea about a D&D &D potential extreme mode, then leave a like. If you've got anything to say on the subject, there are the comments down below. If you're new to the channel, there's a subscribe button just waiting to be clicked. And if you'd like to be notified about anything else that pops up from this channel, then click the notification bell as well. And with all that being said, I will see you guys next time at the gaming table.